Well, um, I hope everyone can hear me um, and you will let me know if you can't. Um, but I'm Fiona Duffy, Director of Development at Murray Edwards College, and I'm sitting here in college. And uh, it's a great pleasure to see so many of you here. Um, we're doing this uh, by webinar format, um, but you can send in questions via the chat and Harriet will take them at the end and I will help Harriet field those questions. So it's a great delight to introduce Harriet to you. Harriet's curator of the New Hall Art Collection. She's been with us for two years, two, more than two years, I think now. Um, and uh, we've gone from strength to strength under her background. She's a specialist in contemporary art. She came to us from Norwich Museums. She has a really deep understanding of female artists and the current field of artworks in the UK. She's got a super clear vision for the collection and what the collection should be and needs to be to celebrate these wonderful artists. And um, it's a great delight always to hear her speak about the collection. So it's a, a great pleasure to uh, have her speak to you and to welcome her. So I'm going to unpin myself and disappear and leave it all to Harriet. So over to you, Harriet. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. What a sweet um, and very generous introduction. Hey. Um, um, so how exciting to be here. I wish we were all doing it in the presence of these beautiful artworks that um, are part of the collection. But I will try my best to bring something of the gorgeousness of the college and the collection to wherever you are. So my talk is about 30 minutes long. Um, I'm really gonna cover the history and some highlights. I'm gonna talk about my many loves of the place. Um, and I'm sure uh, this, a lot of what I will talk about will be familiar to you because obviously I touch on the history of the college. And um, I'm really excited to hear your questions at the end. I love hearing um, about your experience of the college and your, your feelings about the collection. So I really hope we'll be able to have a bit more of a discussion towards the end of my talk. So, Let's start. So what actually is the New Hall Art Collection? Well, it's a permanent collection of modern and contemporary art by women at Murray Edwards College at the University of Cambridge. It's the largest collection of its kind in Europe and the second largest in the world. The National Museum of Women, of women in the Arts in Washington is the, is the first. And it was started by women, celebrates art made by women in a Cambridge college dedicated to the education of outstanding young women. <clears throat> so Newhall, um, as I'm sure you all know, was established in 1954 by Dame Ro Rosemary Murray to address the issue of Cambridge University having the lowest number of female uh, undergraduates of any university in the UK, which I always make a point is perhaps slightly unsurprising given it took the university 600 years to admit women and then another 79 to issue them with degrees. So um, the college, as you know, was named um, after Rosemary Murray and the Edwards family who generously endowed the college in 2008. So when the college kind of needed to expand um, after admitting um, a very small number of, of female undergraduates, it was the Darwin family who donated this piece of land, which is off the Huntington Road, very near Kettle's Yard, um, in order for this bespoke, beautiful, iconic, brutalist building to be um, conceived and built. And I think, and I always make this point, that Rosemary Murray was completely inspired in her choice of architects, um, being Chamberlain Bonham Powell, who went on to design the Barbican Centre in London. And for me, they've really kind of created a visionary brutalist building that through research and understanding more about the architecture was absolutely conceived as a manifesto for the education of women. So by that, I mean for the architects and for Rosemary Murray, they really wanted a building that reached for the sky. And for them, this idea of education and learning was an opportunity for kind of ascension, for um, a better, greater life. And I think this um, emphasis on height was thereby encouraging kind of aiming high. And I think you can see that absolutely with the extraordinary um, iconic dome that we are so encouraged to kind of look up and be ambitious and inspired by the architecture. And I adore the fact that we have this sort of rising servery that even further enforces this sense of kind of rising up, um, which lots of artists are always very keen to try and use um, in performances and such. 
And so this is a sort of beautiful view of Fountain Court, obviously based around a sort of Cambridge cloister. But I always make the point that I think this is anything but cloistered. You have this beautiful, it doesn't feel closed. You have this gorgeous sort of daylight. You have this amazing body of water that for me creates a kind of amazing dynamism within the space and it feels very alive. And um, and the gorgeous kind of aqua, aquamarine of, of the water as well. I always feel like, um, particularly when you're in the bar, you feel like you're on a boat, which I sort of love, it's sort of unsteadying. Um, and the collection is very much kind of everywhere um, in college. It's across the accommodation blocks, it's in the dome, it's in the bar. And it's here in the um, fellows drawing room. You can see um, this beautiful work by Gillian Ayres that was actually a, started as a loan. But then uh, I think her son came and said it looked absolutely fabulous above this mantelpiece that they turned it into a donation. And I think what I love about this image is that it really encapsulates something of the interdisciplinarity of the architecture in that you have the brickwork, but you also have the basket weave and the lighting and it's you just get a sense that it's actually much more than just a building and indeed with the senior combination room another kind of private fellows room again where we have lots of artworks it's interesting to be reminded that this is a domestic space and not uncomplicated to curate a collection within that space so it's a space where people live and study and work and um kind of uh, teases out lots of challenges but also some amazing opportunities I think. So when talking about the collection you absolutely have to start with this marvellous woman um, Dr Valerie Powell who was a historian at UCL before becoming president of Murray Edwards College and she was the president from 81 to 95 and I think it's really interesting that before coming to Murray Edwards she was at UCL and obviously UCL is right next to the Slade, which was one of the most, which it still is, one of the most important art schools um, internationally. But it, what made it absolutely extraordinary was that since its establishment in 1871, it admitted women on equal terms to men. So it was always an incredible place for women artists. And actually, if you look at the number of artists in our collection who studied at the Slade, it is extremely um, a, a large kind of proportion. And so Valerie, and interestingly, their collection is 50% uh, men and women because they would always acquire the prize winners work every year. And so Paul Rego um, is part of that collection. So the, the art museum at the Slade has a really, really interesting art collection. Um, so Valerie obviously knew about the Slade, knew about women artists, was a kind of, was a fan and then came to, Murray, uh, to Newhall and was, part of a committee that appointed Mary Kelly to be the first artist in residence at Newhall and nearby Kettle's Yard. And that was a kind of key turning point in the story of the collection. So Mary Kelly's work you can see here, it's these kind of monochrome works um, in the dome. It's a series of six works called Extas, which is part of a much larger body of work called Interim. She's a sort of American conceptual feminist artist now in her 80s um, still making incredibly important work but this work in particular was made in 86 when she had had um, a huge um, kind of uh, recognition for this landmark work that she made called postpartum document that was all about mother motherhood and particularly her son and his acquisition of language so this body of work called Interim is very much kind of the post-maternal. So she's thinking about aging and she uses devices from women's magazines and she uses this sort of first person narrative all with kind of handwritten text and they're photo laminate. So they're incredibly delicate on the surface of the perspex. And she juxtaposed this text with these um, items of clothing and um, she was very interested in um, ideas around hysteria and Freud and Charcot and these kind of female, so-called so female attributes. And these are things that she's very much kind of grappling in her work. And in a kind of true feminist endeavour, she questions how and why to, does one represent a woman? Um, so you see no kind of one per, one woman identified here, that, that the figure is not objectified, but they are suggested, the pleasures of femininity are suggested through these, these shirts that become increasingly kind of unruffled. So this series of work 
was made during her time in Cambridge. And there's a fantastic interview on our website, actually, um, which coincided with the uh, publication of this book, this catalogue, this brilliant green catalogue. Um, they did an interview in New York, this was before my time, where she spoke. And she talked about walking around the gardens with Valerie and talking about various different things and the interdisciplinary nature of Cambridge at that time and bringing together kind of psychoanalysis and feminine, uh, feminism and um, all these different aspects. So Cambridge was a really, really important time for her. And it meant that she generated lots of kind of really interesting ideas and this body of work. So this work was then acquired for the college and then was really the foundational artwork for the collection. So then Valerie Pearl, alongside the curator Anne Jones, set about building a collection. And the way they did it was to uh, assemble a list of artists. Um, they had a hundred on their, their, their list and they invited donations because they really wanted to inspire the students with female creativity and, and the, the possibility and uh, showcase uh, the extraordinary kind of work of women artists. And I think they assumed they'd get about 25, but extraordinarily they got 75. So artists such as Paul Rego, Maggie Hambling, all donated work. And this was a sort of really interesting moment, I think, um, in, in, in the establishment of the collection. And also, um, not only did they look at more established artists, they also looked at emerging artists. And this is a very important artist called Maud Salter, a Scottish Ghanaian artist, whose work I'm actually doing some um, well, we're building an exhibition of her work for later on this year around this particular series called Zabat, which um, was made in 1989 when uh, she photographed nine black kind of creative women um, for the 105th anniversary of the invention of photography. And she was commissioned by Rochdale Art Gallery. And it's one of um, yeah, a series of nine and the V&A have all, all nine and, and we have one, but I'm trying to assemble as many of them as I can for a showing this September. And then what's interesting about this list was that artists suggested other artists. So Maud Salter gave work early on, spoke at the launch of the collection and also suggested her partner at the time, Lubaina Himmet, who won the Turner Prize in 2017, first woman of colour to win the Turner Prize, makes work which is very much grappling with um, kind of anti-colonial thinking and um, the uh, positioning of kind of African cultures within Western museums. This is a painting, a large scale painting called In Spinster Salt's Collection, which brings together a kind of um, random array of uh, African artifacts. And her work is at once celebrating black creativity, but also critiquing how Western museums have um, sought, researched, interpreted, displayed these objects as well. This is um, another kind of fantastic work in the collection and it has actually been as a kind of personal story for me. But before I move on to talking about the extraordinary Gorilla Girls, who I adore, um, I think it's just worth making the point that this act of collective generosity was not only a kind of extraordinary opportunity for those artists to be generous and, and give their works, it, I think it's interesting to see that as quite a political, quite a radical act of generosity in that they were given a platform and a voice and they wanted to be represented because we know at that time in the early 90s and is still very much the case now that women artists were really not given the recognition or the support or the platforms that they so deserve. So, um, and should say that now kind of moving a bit more up to date, the collection has over 500 works in the collection. We're accredited, so we received accreditation in 2018, which means that we um, adhere to museum standards and we're open to the public and so that we have to, um, but it also recognises us as a kind of really important collection that puts us um, on a platform with other um, museum collections, which is really important. But to return to the Gorilla Girls, we have this work in the collection um, and it's a brilliant sort of, they're a feminist collective. Um, they were established in the late 1980s in America and they always um, take the, they're anonymous, so they always wear gorilla masks and take the names of um, dead female artists. Um, so extraordinarily, um, my predecessor, Eliza Gluckman, managed to 
secure a guerrilla girl coming to Murray Edwards in 2016. This was Frida Kahlo. And their way of working is to use lectures to be their act, their kind of true activists. They take over billboards and do flyers and um, really is a way to uncover gender discrimination in the art world. And this was Frida Kahlo at Murray Edwards. And I was an audience member for this event. I'm aware of the time. I just want to check we're okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, and a kind of key feminist strategy that they use is to do lots of surveys to really kind of understand how many women artists are in your collection, how many women artists are actually on display, how many are in your store. And so after this, I went back to the collection that I looked after in Norwich and we had over 3000 artists in the collection. So I decided to do, we kind of use their method to uncover how many women artists were in the collection in Norwich. And I discovered we had 7%. And, you know, it was a collection that was 300 years old, but nevertheless, that was kind of significantly lower than any kind of regional average, which was around 11%. So on the basis of that, we I actually organized an exhibition called Visible Women, and um, I was able to acquire a really incredible artwork with the support of a, a female a patron called Valeria Napoleoni. But I make the point because I feel that in that moment, the New Hall Art Collection really activated me to make a change or to do something with um, what I was participating in. And I feel that that's something I'm really keen to continue um, with this collection, to really try and be a voice for, um, for women artists and trying to encourage more people to promote their work or support, that, support their work more broadly. Another artist who um, donated work recently is Rose Wiley, who um, absolutely picks up on the point from the Gorilla Girls poster of one of the advantages of being a woman artist is that knowing your career might pick up after you're 80. And that's absolutely um, appropriate for uh, Rose Wiley. So this is a fabulous sort of deconstructed painting. It hangs ceremoniously in the bar. Um, and she won the John, Paul's, uh, John Moore's painting prize at the age of 80. And she had a solo exhibition at the Serpentine in London at the age of 83. And um, she talks about, um, somebody's raised their hand, I feel like I should answer the question. I will go back to them at the end, you keep oh, really? going, but okay. I'll pick you up, I'll definitely pick you okay. up at the end if you, I'll note that you've yeah, got sure, your sure. hands raised and I'll come back to you, thanks. Okay. Um, so she talks about how her, her paintings are, her kind of collages, she uses this sort of real cut and paste technique is very inspired by popular culture here you can see Billy Piper um, stapled uh, to the the canvas and actually this was um, a work that she reworked she made this painting for her daughter's wedding which um, unfortunately kind of fell apart so she sort of plastered over it um, with this Billy Piper sort of collage and she talks about her work wanting to represent relationships and with all of their kind of mess and frayed edges and it's a source of kind of great enjoyment, I think, for the students being centre stage in the bar. This is um, a beautiful work by Barbara Hepworth um, called Ascending Form Gloria from 1958. And there are actually several of them cast in bronze. And it has this quite extraordinary kind of milky patina. Um, her estate comes kind of every couple of years to sort of touch up this, the, the, the sort of white paint around it. And it was, um, a time when Barbara Hepworth kind of returned to spirituality after the death of her son in a plane crash. And so some people see kind of praying hands in the form. Um, it's interesting that the work is on an axis and um, that's partly to do with the, the way the sun faces because for her and her studio in Carbis Bay in St. Ives, the sun would always, um, her studio faced east. And so that's something she always wanted for her sculptures. Um, but one of my, you know, one of my many jobs in this role is to think very strategically and ambitiously and think about how we can position the collection more um, centrally in the art world and beyond. But I also have very day to day jobs, which um, people forget, and but also ones that I'm very fond of. And one of them is cleaning the sculpture. Um, we don't have an in-house conservator for very specialist jobs. We might outsource that, but um, not that long ago, last sort of summer, we do our annual clean. 
um, I went out and cleaned all the outdoor sculptures and, and wearing gloves, of course, but spent time with them kind of pulling out all the leaves and the cobwebs. It's extraordinary what gets caught in those crevices. Um, but actually, I felt so fortunate. I felt really privileged to be able to get so close. And actually, the work is incredibly fleshy when you can touch it. It's very mottled. And um, so there's this amazing intimacy, I think, when you're a curator of a collection of this kind. And I feel incredibly privileged to be um, to be in that role. And you can just see it from the other side here. It's quite a different, a different perspective. This is a, a lovely sort of pairing of works um, by Chantal Joffe and Ishvel Myskov, who are um, who both depicted Ishvel's son Fraser in a portrait. And you can see two very different approaches to portraiture. One very much kind of about detail, and very fine brushwork by the Ishbel Myerskov, and then one much more expressionistic, sort of dripping with paints almost, just much more of a kind of impression. You still get so much of the vulnerability of that child. Um, and these two are incredibly close, family friends there, um, spend a huge amount of time together and paint each other's family and paint each other all the time. And I think this relationship for me, this pairing of works is really symbolic of something that is so runs through the collection, these quite invisible networks that you, so when I take people around the collection, that might be, you know, an artist or curator or mainly artists, they always, they always see someone they know in the collection. So that might be somebody they shared a studio with, someone who supported them, somebody who mentored them, somebody who provided a referee for an application. It's really, really there. And this kind of support network and support structure is, is, is just entangled with this collection. And I feel like this pairing of works really speaks of that, of, the, of that kind of intimacy and support. So, thinking about kind of recent things that we've done for the collection, thinking about my sort of um, ideas for the collection going forward. I think what makes the collection and the college so unique is its interdisciplinarity. We obviously have all these different students studying different subjects, all these different fellows, different architecture. It is such a rich tapestry um, and a rich context, I think, to, to make work and to be presenting work. And I can think of no better example of an artist responding to that or an artist's practice working in that context than Linda Sterling. So these are two images of a performance that we did on the cusp of lockdown. We, we were just so fortunate for it to happen. It was on the 14th of March and it was to coincide with her um, UK retrospective, which was at Kettle's Yard. And we collaborated with Amy Tobin, the curator on a commission for the Dome. Now, Linda is a very important kind of British feminist artist, been making work since the 70s, known very much for her collages that involve women and domestic objects. And this was part of an iteration of her Bower of Bliss, which had been shown at Glasgow Women's Library in Chatsworth. And she's very interested in kind of female utopian spaces and spaces of pleasure and sensuality. And it was extraordinary and it combined performers and ballet dancers. Uh, Murray Edwards student who was a ballet dancer um, participated costumes and it was a kind of dance collage where she brings in all of these different elements, flowers from the garden. It was all just such a sumptuous display um, and a celebration of a kind of female um, creativity and I think also felt incredibly um, sort of heightened because of the fact that we knew that something was about to uh, happen, which was of course the lockdown and, and the coronavirus. We also do exhibitions. So this is another exhibition that opened on International Women's Day. We had a fabulous day last year with student led talks and tours of the Femfolio exhibition. And we had an artist, um, Perminda Kaur, come to talk about her work. And we work a lot with the art history students um, and they uh, we offer lots of kind of volunteering opportunities and for them to participate in the programme. I'm always really, really keen for them to tell me as much as possible about what we should be doing. But this was an exhibition in Lower Fountain Court, which is where we have our two annual shows. And it was a, a portfolio that we were generously donated by Marjorie Marte. 
um, and it's a 20 works on paper by the leading American feminist artists from the 1970s, but it was commissioned in 2003. So a number of those artists were kind of reflecting on some of the key themes that have endured throughout their career, whilst others were sort of updating them in a more kind of contemporary vernacular. Um, for instance, we have a work here by Emma Amos and a work uh, on the left, and then on the right is a beautiful work by um, Faith Ringgold. And um, I'm quite aware of the time. I've got three minutes. I'll just, well, I, might, I might take a little bit more. I might take more like five. I hope that's all right. Um, and the point I always make about the collection um, is uh, generosity, which I just feel is the lifeblood of the, not only the collection, but the place. So the fact that we're open to the public every day, we're not coming out of a pandemic. Um, all the works have been donated. And Joe Cobb, who I'm sure you all know or, or should know, who's the head gardener, she allows the staff and the students to pick the flowers, the foliage and the fruit and anything else is in the garden that you want. She's happy to share it with you. And for me, that just encapsulates just like how wonderful it is and this feeling of this is for people to enjoy and share and and I feel that with what I want to do is like bringing more of the public in and broadening our audiences that we bring people in that who might never apply to a Cambridge college or have probably never stepped foot in a Cambridge college yet they've lived in Cambridge for 25 years you know so I'm I really feel like my very aligned with what the what the college is and wants to do um and I feel yeah that's a it's a really huge part of kind of what motivates me in in my job um I think this is one of my favorite works in the collection um it's by Rose Garrard really important British feminist artist and for me this is a work that sort of speaks volumes of many things so it's a work that sits at the bottom of one of the beautiful staircases and um, it's a it's a work that depicts Judith Leister, who was a 17th century Dutch artist, a very successful artist. And it's her self-portrait that Rose Garrard has sort of um, co-opted for her work. And then on the exterior, on the side is this beautiful sort of plaster uh, frame that literally tumbles to the floor. And it's actually a Madonna that Rose Garrard would have on her bedside. And it, as you look at the frame, it becomes kind of increasingly animated. And there's so many readings to this work that, you know, the whiteness of the plaster in a way is symbolic of the erasure of women artists over art history. Um, the fact that it falls to the floor, it literally takes up space. It's kind of saying we are here. Women artists need to be in the spaces where we see art. I guess for me, what I love about it is that in between the works, between Rose Garrard and Judith Lacey, you can see the bricks and mortar of the college that is a kind of, I would hope, a support structure for women artists across the past and the present. So it's a very sort of key work for me. Um, this, I think, is a beautiful quote. And I often say kind of why people ask, why do we need a collection of work by women? I guess a similar thing that Barbara probably talks about a lot. Why do you need a college for women? And for me, a fellow put it so beautifully in that it is, um, it writes a wrong. It, the underrepresentation of women's art over the course of human history. So we have lots to do. Um, but that's essentially my talk. I'm, there's lots more I could talk about, upcoming projects, um, but uh, I will leave it there because we can cover that perhaps in the discussion. And I would just love to say that if you're interested in the collection, if you want to know more, we have a newsletter which you can sign up to through our website or we can disseminate information through the development team. But thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you so much, Harriet. That is just fantastic. Uh, a really exciting overview of the collection. And I'm sure that um, uh, all of our audience were, were thoroughly engaged. And you can see the questions that the hands were going up and the questions are coming in. So um, I am going I'm, I'm going to try my best, everybody, <laughs> to keep track of the questions for Harriet and, um, and to uh, come to you. And if I can, I will try and uh, let the participant speak to ask her question um, if I can try and use the technology to unmute you. Um, so bear with me, I'll try. Um, but while I, while I start looking at that, Harriet, and I try to work it out, there is one question that's come in from Barbara. 
Yeah. Um, I, actually, and, and I don't know what people can see of my screen. So I don't know if I've just opened the Q&A and everyone can see it. Maybe you can. If you can't, that's great, actually, because that means I can see things behind the scenes. But Barbara wants to know, in terms of collecting policy, what are the earliest works we collect and how international are the artists represented in the collection? The potential boundaries of women's art seem endless. They are indeed. And I, I think Harriet's got a good answer for you, Barbara. Yeah, um, I totally agree with you on that. Um, so in terms of the collecting policy, so the, uh, well, the earliest work I think that we have in the collection is 1905, which is by um, Mary Cassatt, an incredible print uh, by a really important kind of American feminist artist, um, impressionist artist, sorry, not a feminist artist, 1905. Um, and so we do have works from the early 20th century. <clears throat> But, um, and how international are, I'll answer that too. Um, so, but what I have done since I've been in post is to try and refine what it is that we collect and how we develop the collection, because exactly as you say, it's, it's too broad and we need to have criteria by which we assess things. And for me, that is that if you look at the collection, you know, it started in 86, it's really strong on feminist work. It's a very, we have lots of abstract works. So not everything fits this, of course, but I have sort of said going forward, if we are to solicit donations or actively encourage artists to donate work, that it should be with artists for who, who look critically at ideas around race, representation and gender. Because we're a women's college, it's a women's collection, it just, Mary Kelly was the first artist. It all just sort of fits so that in order to try and make the programme and the collection a bit more coherent is to try and be more strategic about what we collect. So that's the sort of element of your question. And then in terms of international, it's really, really interesting. So we, um, we are predominantly British American artists. Um, we had a student called Anastasia Kolomietz, who was part of the, who's a third year art history student who came and did a survey of the artists of colour in our collection. But then she also has been looking at Jewish artists, Latin American artists. Um, we've also been thinking about Irish artists. You know, it's, it's we've been thinking about nationalities as much as we can. Um, so I would say it's predominantly British and American, but we are trying to engage in all of those areas where possible and resources, you know, um, available. I think the difficulty is, is that we can't be comprehensive. You know, I'm just the only member of staff really. Um, so we have to work within what we have. And for me, that's often working with fellows. So if we have a fellow in college, which we do have several at the moment, and we have a Palestinian fellow who knows a lot about Palestinian art, we have another fellow who knows a lot about Latin American art, you know, it's about, working with the research that we have in-house to try and support how we grow the collection and how we try and get border representation across those nationalities. I hope that's answered your question. Great, thanks Harriet. Um, I'm, Patricia, I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask your question, I think. So here we go. Have a go. Didn't seem to work. Maya, I'll try you as well in case. Oh, hang on a minute, ask to unmute, ask to unmute. Meanwhile, shall I answer Catherine's answer question? Answer the next one, Catherine's question about students. Yeah, go ahead. Um, about borrowing works. Uh, we don't do that anymore because we're accredited. So um, because of accreditation, we have to be, um, really stringent about our policies around conservation and framing and um and security really simply um so we we don't do that but i'm not sure the students would want it in their room i think it's everywhere else um as soon as they step foot out of their room there's art everywhere so from my my feeling from talking to students is that um they have quite strong views about what's outside of their rooms so um i try to support that as much as possible Thanks, Harriet. I think the JCR still have a few of their own works yeah. hanging around. So I, yeah, I think do. it's not entirely out of the question, but it's not part of the standard collect, the, 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 the main collection now. 
Um, Maya and Patricia, I can't seem to unmute you or you haven't unmuted yourselves, but if anyone wants to put a question in the chat, I'll, I'll happily pick it up from there. Um, Barbara said, thank you. Um, I'd like to, if there are, are there any more questions? If not, I've got loads of questions I could ask Harriet. <laughs> ask people to unmute themselves. This is the joy of uh, doing it by webinar and I knew this might get a bit tricky. I've normally got lots of questions. Have everybody found the chat down the bottom or the Q and A? There are still people. There are still twenty-four people out there, so they must have questions. Harriet, if I was to ask you what you'd like to happen in the next five years, <laughs> big time frame. Yeah. What do you think you'd do? Let, assuming, and I and, and I'd like to say, um, the curator has been for the last seven years. Uh, part-time and temporary because it's always been supported by donations um, from uh, very generous donors and most recently from Professor Griselda Pollock, um, an art historian at the University of Leeds, who again was very involved in the early part of the, the early time of the collection and is still involved um, now. Um, and you know, the, so you know, keeping a curator in post occupies quite a bit of my time. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, but Harriet, do you do you must have plans for you know what we could achieve? You know, with a with some security and um, and and knowledge that you know we could keep everything going. What what do you think we should be doing? Yeah, I think there's lots of things I'd love to do, which, um, as you say, the funding being precarious is always very it can be quite hindering to mm -hmm. kind of have those conversations. But I think I would love to um, make longer term partnerships with places like the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington. I'd love to think more internationally. Um, I would love to work with other museums and galleries for to do kind of co-acquisitions and co-commissioning, which I think is really exciting, a way of kind of pooling your resources and your expertise with other colleagues in the sector to really try and bring in um, some really incredible artworks. I'd love to have a more strategic campaign to fill some gaps in our collection. I think that we um, need to have more women of colour in the collection. I think there are some really um, obvious artists that are not part of the collection. And I think if you have stability and you can assure an artist that there will be a curator in post for a longer period of time, and then they're much more likely to give if you feel like, if they feel that there's that kind of um, commitment. So I think that would be possible. Um, I want to carry on doing big performances. I think they're amazing and they work really, really well. I think that we're quite, it's difficult to bring in mem lots of members of the public because it's essentially it's a college, but we can do these like key landmark moments and where we can bring in a big audience and have a really big impact. So I'd love to carry on with, with that. Um, and carrying on with the advocacy about women artists. I feel like there's a lot more we can do. There's a lot of conversation about this. It's a really great time um, to be having these conversations. It's, a, it's an impossibly difficult time for, for artists, for women artists we know, particularly in light of the pandemic. So I feel that there's a lot of kind of um, advocacy and work we can do around that, all of which one can do if you feel that you're not having to your contract's running out in a year. Mm, yeah, good point. <laughs> so we hear you clearly. And um, Patricia, <laughs> Patricia, I think has managed to unmute herself. I hope you have Patricia. If you can hear us, please ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, I'm really answering simply to clarify that I was actually enlarging a picture when I, my hand was raised. And oh. But just to say thank you very much for doing yeah. this. It's been very informative and helpful. Great to have you join us and thank you, Patricia. Um, that's fantastic. Um, there's another question that came in on the chat. Again, uh, as, as from another Catherine, uh, are you selective in who you accept? Um, you know, do we, you know, what do we take now? And if someone was to offer us a work by somebody who was less well known or not, uh, you know, how do we how do we judge what's what's good? And actually, that's quite a fundamental and you and I've had quite a few conversations about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we, we we try to refine our strategy and our criteria for accepting work and, and, and soliciting work so that we also have something to judge it by when somebody sends something in. So it is, you know, we are wanting to um, think about work that does deal with critically about ideas around what it is to be a woman, what it is to be 
you know, identity, essentially. Um, but having said that, if somebody has a Bridget Riley painting and <laughs> they really want to give it to us, um, you know, uh, I think one has to not be too narrow focused about, I mean, that 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 is there to provide us with a structure and um, a focus. But I also think with anything, you have to think more broadly about, well, what what is that? What's their position? Uh, what contribution have they made? You know, all of it. So there are lots of other elements that come into it, but essentially we, we yeah. Yeah. Um, a really fantastic question has come in uh, from Kate Allen that says she was very moved by your description of uh, how Dame Rosemary thought about the uh, architecture of the college. Um, what are the developments or architectural developments to the college that you can think of that might um, improve the display of the art? Uh, don't go to town on a new building, but <laughs> another conversation. Yeah, uh, uh, Bespoke Gallery, please. Like, <laughs> like um, uh, Downing, is it Downing? They've got the Heon Gallery. It's just yeah. such a beautiful gallery. It's quite small, but it's very beautiful. Um, lighting would be amazing having okay. some really good lighting um i always feel like museum curators we're all guilty of it being such an afterthought but actually i think it can kind of ensure that an exhibition really sinks or swims um so better lighting would be great um but but, if, if, but yeah would you would you like a, dis a bespoke gallery space that was more like a traditional gallery or would that change what this collection is and does yeah i mean i think if somebody offered us millions and millions of pounds to build a gallery i'm not going to say no but i do i i do feel very strongly that the beauty and the uniqueness of the collection is that it is within this building and um so i would i would yeah i would be reluctant to up sticks because I think the collection was very much conceived as a, a collection that people live with and have around them all the time it's um but it is lovely to see those works put in galleries so we lent our Labena Himid and the Mary Kelly to an exhibition at the Heon Gallery called We Are Here which was all about women artists and the story of Cambridge colleges and the works looked incredible and you know you could actually see the Mary Kelly as you should which was meant to, you know she conceived them really for bus stops so that people were able to see their reflection in them and to read the text really easily. Oh, Whereas inevitably okay. the dome, you know, they're quite high up, they're quite hard to read. So yeah, yeah. I think it's sort of great. So, and um, are there other things that we can't, we can't do here? Are we limited by the fact it's a, we're a living space? I mean, where, yes, where, is, I think so. The, so what? So what can? You know, what can we display, and what can't we display? Where? Are, what are the limitations? What are the things that you you think that if we weren't if we weren't eating in the dome? <laughs> what would I you think it that with? well, there are certain um, kind of uh, med mediums media that we can't consider. Yeah. We can't really we can't really acquire performance because you need um, you need quite big budgets to ensure and a lot of stability to be able to ensure that there'll there'll be budgets to kind of perform those performances in the future um film is very difficult uh, photography is becoming increasingly difficult because of the daylight ah. um so we we are quite constrained and we also have to be mindful of work that causes offense um oh. because we do have people that haven't decided to come to a gallery to see something and where you, it's quite difficult to choreograph or at least choreograph the messaging if you go to Tate Modern and you might see something that might cause offence there would be signage and you're there because you know you're going to see art whereas obviously there are lots of people using the college all the time that haven't made that decision so that that's also an element we have to think really carefully about the content but I think the great thing is, is that the College Council is always very um, keen, I think, not to shy away from works that could be conceived as difficult mm. to, um, but that is, that is, some, that is, that it is a different, it's a different um, context to a kind of gallery. And you, ha you do have to think about that. You have to think sensitively about the, the different people that see the artworks and what's going on with them at the time. 
That's quite interesting. There's a couple of questions coming in on the chat now. So Emma Wilshaw, what do you think the collection could offer a male student of art doing an A-level course? So engaging younger men with our collection and, and, and actually maybe you've got some reflections on and whether, the, whether there are any male history of our students. That came yeah, there are and they're actually great. really active. They're and really active. Um, so I'll let, you, I'll let you take that one and then we can take the one in the chat, which is about performances. But yeah, if, there's, if you've got more to say about Absolutely. I mean, going back to kind of Barbara's brilliant work with collaborating with men, you know, this is not a conversation we can just have on our own. Um, absolutely not. And um, I always think it's brilliant when um, the yeah, the most engaged history of art students that I take around the collection or do lectures with are follow up and we do events with them. So we recently did a collaboration with Bait, which is a student magazine. It's a bit like it's a bit more experimental than the Maze Anthology. Is it but, like um, a zine? It's a zine. Exactly. Yeah. And that was all run by a, a history of art student, male student. So, no, I think it's absolutely vital that we're talking to everybody, um, particularly given how powerful we know they become. So, and it's, um, not, and it's interesting because it's great that the the male art students, once they're here, are engaged and engaging. I think you know, I think once you've got them that far, um, mm -hmm. what's interesting is I think um, we've talked about schools work before, haven't we? Is the limitations for us about doing schools work, given your part timeness <laughs> and and the fact that there's just you? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely, I think you know we could definitely be proactive and either encourage school groups to come whatever uh, gender or sex they were and or produce materials but actually that's sort of that would be in my understanding an added extra that actually you know takes you beyond what what we've got now um mm -hmm. i'm assuming that you'll just sort of nod your head and agree with that although that's a shame and it would be great to do some of that stuff we're not the sort of collection that would have that sort of education team because of where we are and what we're doing and the limitations we've got of the resources mm -hmm. um someone has asked if the performances have done have they ever been recorded some of the ones we've described you've described yes. seem fabulous is there a way they could be shared more fabulously i do think that that recording there is a recording so yeah, yeah. there is i'm just trying to find the link this my, is, this i think one. it's on the kettles yard website yeah there is i'm going to just put this this is the most amazing um uh, essay written by Actually, Amy Gribben. Uh, you, need, you might need to post that again to everybody because I think you just posted it to me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm enjoying this chat even though you can't see me. I hope everyone else is enjoying this um, So that, that's an essay, but... Um, I think the link to the... Uh, I, think I will send the link. A... It's definitely on the Kettles Yard website. We we did film it. We Because of the pandemic, um, we live streamed it as well, but the live stream is not as good as the film inevitably because it's quite poor quality um but it's it's definitely on the kettles yard website um but yes documentation is really important we're organizing another performance this july with um alberta whittle who's a artist from barbados based in scotland and because of social distancing we, we can have a kind of minute audience but we will be documenting that as well so yeah, it's really, really important and something and I the feel. The best way is for people to go onto the New Hall Art Collection website. So if you Google New Hall Art Collection, you can find the website and sign up if you're not already on it yeah, to the, the, e the email newsletter. And uh, that comes out fairly regularly and it'll have information about upcoming events, but also recordings that are available and things like that. So if, you, if you're not on that, it's worth joining in. Um, I think there was a question coming in about... Um, Oh, I know. I wondered if you wanted to talk about your film. Oh yeah, my re the beautiful film. So we could, well, you just mention it and say, you know, we'll definitely send it. We can send it round. So yeah, we you want to we, say we, what you what you've done. What we've done. So we um, we've commissioned a film. I think part of um, lock kind of lockdown has made us move to digital. We've done lots of digital events. We've moved our program online. We've really try to embrace that as much as we can and um, we've commissioned a fabulous uh, cinematographer called Kenny, um, Kenny Richardson who has made a 12 minute film about um, the collection and incorporating some of the elements that I talked about the architecture and it includes contributions with uh, Lucy Delap, who is a historian fellow at Murray Edwards um, she's a historian in gender studies and so she talks and we look at the plans of the building and then we talk to um, Joe Cobb, the wonderful Joe Cobb, who I mentioned before about the gardens. 
And then we move to um, an artist, Gail Chong Kwan, a really important artist who gave us a big donation of five works for photographs that are in the fellow's dining room. So they're, they're photographs of food, sort of sculptural um, sculptures that she made out of food that relate very much to kind of the touristic gaze in Mauritius, where her father's from. And then we talk to a student who um, talks about what it was like to live amongst this collection. And she focuses specifically on the Maud Salter. Um, and it's beautiful. So uh, Candida Richardson is, uh, she makes architectural films. So she's just captured the architecture really beautifully. Um, and it was really fortunate because it was in the kind of slightly gray day in February, but it was a day when we got kind of beautiful sunny spells. And so she did a marvelous job of uh, putting together this film. So we haven't broadcast it very widely yet, but um, it is it will be available. So will be yes. Yeah. So um, certainly, if you sign up to the uh, the art collection newsletter, um, you'll get details of of where it will be and when you can when when you'll be able to view that. Because uh, we're still working out how and when we share that. But um, also, if you um, uh, you like to follow the New Hall Art Collection is on Twitter if you if you're a Twitterer so uh, and there's regular postings there about what's going on particularly about events that might be short notice or um, collaborations you're doing on information about other things that are going on in Cambridge and beyond in art collections so that's really worth following your feed um, uh, that's that's certainly how I find it and <laughs> Instagram and, Insta and Instagram oh, and those who are yeah for the younger crowd the Insta I don't use that obviously um, <gasps> Are there any final questions? I just wondered if anyone wants, to, anyone wants to put their hand up, I will watch for you or send a Q&A or send a chat. Letting people have a second. Oh, hang up. yes, here we go. <laughs> uh, Lynn Williams, are you ever able to involve students and fellows in decisions on what works to acquire by voting on a choice of a handful of possibilities? Mm. Do you want to talk about how we do that? So we have never done voting, but we do have on our internal kind of art committee that comprises of staff and fellows from the college, we have the JCR art rep. Um, so the student body are kind of represented through them and they are part of that. And whenever we have um, offers of donations or um, you know, a particular opportunity to, to acquire something, that always goes to the committee. So their view is always um, heard as part of yeah. that committee. Yeah. And we used to have a, um, an art advisory board and in a way we still do have an art advisory board, but the reason it was set up was before we had a professional curator in post to actually when we were um, taking um, all offers of works to help us um, look at work that were being offered and to give us professional advice about what was being offered to us. Um, but obviously now we have a professional curator with, <laughs> with Harriet and her predecessor, Eliza, um, the, their role in, in um, arbitrating on what should come into the collection and not is different, especially now as we don't really collect, as you said before, unsolicited works but we're being very targeted about um, what we'd like to collect either by talking to those um, who own works or the artists themselves or their representatives and sometimes we get um, we're in touch with patrons who help us buy works um, but the college itself doesn't buy in fact we had we've had a conversation Harriet haven't we about whether we should whether we are buying works or whether we are asking artists to give and how that on the dynamic of that in generosity you do you want to I'm, I'm happy to have you say what your your perspectives on it because Harriet won me round on this view <laughs> well I mean it's really just trying to stay true to like yeah. our origin story which was this collective act of generosity I think yeah. the difficulty is if you start buying work which we don't have the means to anyway yeah you set up a division automatically of like okay well those artists were donating and those artists are being paid for and also, it's, it would just be, um, yeah. So I think I think it's it's that really to truly really try and mm. honour those yeah. that 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 that, that, that initial that. concept and representation of it. And and you've heard directly from recent artists who've joined and what they've said about the power of being in this group of women and why it's important. Exactly, it's like Gail Chokwan, You know, in the film we've just made, she says that she she, she feels part of a community of strength. I mean, they're her words and. 
I mean, what I am exploring is how can we think about that support structure for them? And mm. I think the more we're able to be a kind of advocate for women artists, yeah. the more yeah. women will feel like that's something that they want to be part of. Yeah. I also am looking at the a, a kind of um, a contract where they might get a... So, for instance, if we lent, lent work to a museum or a, an yeah. exhibition there would be a fee for that and could a proportion of that fee go back to the artists is mm. there a way of putting that in their donation form when they mm. make the donation but it's quite hard to factor in inflation and change of mm. fee mm. but I, it is something I'm looking at and I'm yeah. consulting okay. with commercial galleries to see what they think is realistic and that's also great but, yeah great. I think we can wrap up I'd just like to say thank you again it's been brilliant thanks to everybody for all of their thoughtful and interesting questions about how this collection fits in and, and how we keep it going and, and how the students react to it. I can see people are starting to drift off as we come to the end of it. But thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. And um, <laughs> OK, Emma, get in touch with Harriet <laughs> or, the, or at Art Collection. So yeah. and um, uh, we uh, yeah, I think that's probably it. Just to say thank you for everyone for coming. Thank you to Harriet for her time and her generosity in, in giving her time this evening. I hope that the rest of bath time goes fine for you this evening. Very and, quiet, so I'm fine. I'm going to go <laughs> And um, we will wrap up. So um, thanks for everybody for coming. So we'll just let everybody send in their thanks because that's the nice bit. You can leave them on the chat. Well, thank <laughs> so, you very much. Anyway, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. Thank you.